I'm glad you noticed it's 310. OK, so CPT maps. Um, <coughs> no, where's the point? Yeah. So we, uh, we just uh, proved a CPT does not mean charge parity and time reversal, by the way, in case you were thinking that. Uh, <coughs> we just proved that tracing out degrees of freedom, which means physically ignoring them in a measurement, that's what it means, lowers the relative entropy. Now, this, this can be generalized to arbitrary CPT maps, which we first explained what they are. Uh, this generalization is sometimes called a data processing inequality. That's a lot of words. And it has something to do with the connection between entropy and entanglement, which is what I want to get to. So here's CPT maps. So let H and K be Hilbert spaces. And let uh, B of H and B of K be the bounded linear maps, that is, the observables, and the two respectively. And, <coughs> uh, and uh, let phi be a linear map from B of H, the bounded linear maps on H, to the bounded linear maps on K. So that means I'm just mapping one physical system onto another. And we say that this map is a positive trace-preserving map, PT, if two things are true. First of all, if whenever you map positive operators, you end up with a positive operator. That's one fact. And the second is it preserves traces. So a trace of something does not change under this map. Now, I just want to point out that preserving trace does not mean preserving the identity. One is the dual of the other, with preserving traces. I'm, I'm thinking mentally of moving density matrices from one system to another, comparing two systems. That's what I'm thinking of. And this map uh, takes me from one, takes me from the language of one to the language of the other. It's uh, a CPT map that is completely positive, completely positive, this is a sticky point now, pay attention. If for any other Hilbert space L, phi tends it with the identity of this other Hilbert space is positive and trace preserving. A CPT map is also called a channel in this business of communication. Now, this is uh, so what happened here? Close. Whoops. Cancel that one. All right. Uh, what, uh, what do I do to close? Again. Huh? Do not show this again. Click on that. Hmm? Press enter. What do I do? Oh, I, ah, I see. OK. I go over there. Whoops. I'm not very good at this map thing. Oh, close? It's, I was trying to click this. OK, don't, don't give up. Don't head for the exit. Hang in there. I have to explain all what this, what this means. So quantum communication and quantum information is all about CPT maps, whether you like it or not. When we do something to a density matrix of a system, such as adding or removing degrees of freedom by taking traces, whatever we do, uh, we're constantly manipulating systems. We want to be sure that we do two things, that we preserve positivity. That's very uh, important. We, a density matrix becomes a density matrix. It doesn't suddenly get negative eigenvalues or anything like that. And we want to preserve the trace, because the trace is the thing that you use to measure things. OK. Uh, now, Here's the sticky point. We also want to preserve these properties. When we think of our system, the one we're looking at and the one we're going to, as being the subsystem of the universe. That's what tensor the identity means. You see, 
system, eventually you're going to, well, not eventually, but you might want to take your system and the one you map it to and tensor on some other system. You want to compare with the third one somewhere floating around. You want to be sure that the positive map that you've made remains positive. Now, this sounds a little bit strange, but I'll give you a counterexample and then you'll see my, my point. If you think about it for a while, you'll see that this latter condition of being able to tensor on the identity is, uh, is that when we tensor on the identity, we preserve positivity. The trace condition, uh, by the way, is automatic. That's easy. It's the positivity. Steinspring's theorem, which I'll come to next, shows how to view this as ordinary unitary time evolution followed by tracing out the environment. And I'll come to that next. A simple example of a PT but not CPT map is the one that takes a matrix into its transpose. And your homework problem is to do the following. Check what happens for this transpose map when H and K and L are just two dimensional. If you understand this, you will have understood a lot. So take a matrix, positive matrix. My map is going to be a linear map. I turn it around like that. That's a linear map, right? If the original matrix was positive, positive definite, I mean, I turn it around like that, it's still positive definite. Okay? Now, what does it mean to tensor on the identity? It means if I take my matrix, let's say it's a two by two matrix, for example, I take my matrix and make four copies of it, and this way make a, a big matrix. That new matrix you could easily check is positive definite if the original little two by two was, or the four by four is. But now, if I take each of those squares and I transpose them, like that, you will easily check, I hope you will easily check, that the resulting 4 by 4 matrix you get is not necessarily positive definite, even though this little square is. Got it? So go home and do it for you by yourself, and you'll see that the transpose map is a positive uh, definite map, but not when you tensor on the identity. That's the thing you have to understand, and uh, sorry about that. But now, how do you tell when a map, uh, what is it, how do you characterize a map that's completely positive and trace preserving? Well, Krauss figured out how to do this, if and only if you can write it in the following way. Your map, your CPT map, is in the following form. If I take my, map, my matrix A, and hit it on both sides with any matrix you like and it's adjoint, then that's still positive. And if the sum of these, you do it several times and add them up, if the sum of the daggers times the non-daggers, the F stars times F, add up to the identity, <coughs> that will preserve the trace. Because when you take trace, you can move the F over to this side, so you get the sum of F star F so that will preserve the trace of A. And each little term is positive if A is. So that's what a completely positive trace preserving map looks like. So there are these cross operators associated with uh, CPT map. So any good physical map is of this form. There may be a lot of these F star Fs in there, but that's another story. Now, the homework problem is, what if I change the condition to FF star is the identity? I won't preserve the trace then. What will I preserve? Now think about that. That's your homework problem. What if I change the condition? Now, Steinspring earlier had uh, found a general characterization of CPT as follows, a, a, a different one. Well, it's actually the a generalization of the first one, really. Uh, but he found this earlier, and that you can do it in the following way. You take your matrix that you want to transform. You tensor on the identity, or some kind of identity. It doesn't matter what, but we're going to consider any possibility you like. 
and hit it on both sides with the unitary. Okay, that preserves trace and preserves everything, positivity and so on. Then, after you've done all of that, then you take the partial trace over this auxiliary uh, uh, space that you've tagged on, take it over that. Now you're back to the original space and you've got a map now that's linear, that's and positive and trace preserving and is even completely positive. So that's how it works. And of course you need that u as a unitary. And <coughs> so this can, says that a CPT map can be thought of as first embedding the space in a bigger space, and then uh, your matrix, I mean, in a bigger space, and then rotating it, and finally bringing it back with a partial trace. And that's what a CPT map looks like. And <coughs> We shall now use this to extend the monotonicity of relative entropy, which I proved to you before, well, to the data processing inequality, data processing inequality for this general CPT map. The extra space L, which helped us affect the CPT map and then disappeared, is called an ancillon. And I'm just mentioning this because that's the word you'll frequently see in this business. But that's not important. But frequently, such auxiliary spaces are used in this sort of, oops, wrong direction. So here's the data process in the inequality. So recall that the relative entropy of two density <coughs> matrices, you take the trace of rho against log rho minus log sigma. So it's a measure of the difference. And recall that it's monotone under partial traces. So S of uh, rho 1, sigma 1, which I get after tracing out 2, is smaller than the relative entropy before I did that. Now, trace over 2 is a CPT map, if you think about it. Very trivial. And we want to uh, generalize this inequality to general CPT arbitrary CPT maps, and this is called the data processing inequality. So rho 1, 2 becomes simply rho, and rho 1 becomes uh, phi of rho. And we're, we're applying this map to rho 1, 2, and, and all, or sigma and so on. And thus this monotonicity or DP, uh, data processing inequality is the following for all CPT maps that you do any CPT map to rho and the same one to sigma, that lowers the entropy, the relative entropy. Sorry, question. Yes. Go back a slide. Can I go back a slide? Yeah, well, I'll try. I don't guarantee anything. Whoops, see? I did it wrong. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to understand the counting of this guy because you're saying that u is a unitary matrix. Yes. But a lives in a Hilbert space of some dimension. Phi of A lives in a Hilbert space of a different dimension. So it seems to me that U is not. No, wait, wait. What, what lives in a. Uh, phi maps A into, into, into something. Yeah. Of, of H, right? It's yeah. Of K. Yeah, these, these are. These are sorry. Hmm? Well, really, you, if, if the dimensions are not the same, if that's what's bothering you, yeah. then U is a partial isometry. I wrote it this way U, U star is the identity. It's a partial isometry. Okay. So in that case, it's a partial isometry as opposed to a unitary where basically the phi of A and A live in the same Hilbert space? Yes. How should I be thinking of that physically? How so should I? This is, this is more or less a map between the system and then its time evolved unitary. Yeah. Where I have some coupling to an environment in the middle. Yeah. Um, but yeah. now if, it's, if they're not the same space before and after, how should I be thinking of that physically? I don't fully understand the question. I want to, this is a mathematical characterization. I could build the CPT map this way with the help of an auxiliary space. It, it's not terribly physical, but it's very useful for the next step. So, Steinspring is a mathematician, not a physicist. So, <laughs> Oh, what nice. I'm asking is, if, if K and H are the same Hilbert space, yes. Hilbert space of the same dimension, yeah. it seems to me this has a fairly 
clear physical interpretation. Okay, good. Is there such an interpretation, in no, your opinion, I, if they are not the same tone? Yeah, because I can, by a CPT map, in fact, it's important, I can map anything into anything, basically. Any dense in one space into a density matrix on another space. It's very wide range. That's a map map. Yeah, but. Physical. Can you think of a system where I would kind of somehow couple it to an and then trace out? Yes, we're going to do that. Okay. We're going to map density matrices, and, uh, general density matrices, onto. Uh, product of Bell states and things like that. Yeah, uh, definitely. We want, we want to compare things. Okay. Our, our goal is to compare things, compare information content. So we have to be able to map our given physical space onto some abstract space containing Bell states, for example, and see how, what it takes to do that. And that's a measure of entanglement. Yeah. Is there a restriction on the dimension of L? No. Like, no. So you no. can just take like a qubit and join that to some. Yeah. No. That's right. There's no restriction on L. <coughs> okay. Um, hmm? so I guess the, this is the CEI version. I mean, for the trace, if you took the trace of the phi of A, you would get the trace of A times the dimension of L. Yeah. So the, I mean, if it's a Did I write it wrong? No. We should normalize the IL, I guess. It may not be clear. I mean, we took the trace yeah. of V of A. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes, I have so to divide by. Yes, that. you're right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, where am I now? We did that. Uh, all right. Sorry. So, the the so because the CPT map can be regarded as essentially taking a partial trace, I can relate this problem of showing this inequality, the DPI inequality, to this one, which involves partial traces, because the the map phi can be written as a partial trace. That's what we just discussed. That's Stein's proof. So once I know how to prove this, which I did. I can prove that. So CPT maps, therefore, lower, lower uh, uh, relative entropy. Okay, sorry. That, that's where I was had intended to end this morning. So that's the end of this morning's lecture. Okay, and now we start today's lecture. Um, entanglement. So now we talk about entanglement, which is what everybody came for, right? Okay, so we have two objects, say uh, two Hilbert spaces. You know, I remind you, degrees of freedom or particles or systems, it's two somethings. They don't have to be the same thing. And they're described by states, which are density matrices on Hilbert spaces, H1 and H2, and the combined space is H12, and the density matrix on H12 is rho 1 2 and row one is the partial trace of row one, two, and so on. A simple example of a state with no correlations whatsoever between the two systems is row one tenths of row two. And this has the property that if I take the partial trace over two, I get row one as I'm supposed to. And there's obviously no correlations here, they're just independent. And we say that row one, two is not entangled if it is separable. These two words mean the same thing. And what does that mean? It means I can write row one, two as a positive sum, a convex combination, a positive sum of simple tensor products of this kind. I don't have to have a, just a simple tensor product, but I have a sum of simple tensor products. Now I can always write row one, two in this form if I don't insist that the lambdas are positive numbers. But if I insist that they're positive numbers, then I say uh, row one, two is not entangled, it is separable. So the question is whether I can get away with positive numbers. Okay. And then, of course, the sum of the lambdas have to add up to one. Um, if it is not possible to do this, we say, that row one, two is entangled. Okay. 
Now, how many terms do I need in this summation? Well, if everything is finite dimensional, I have to have at most d1, d2 plus 1. These are the dimensions, but that's not, in it, not important. Uh, as I already said this, it's always possible to decompose row 1, 2 into a sum of products, but not always with positive lambda. That's the crucial issue before the house. Okay, who knows about that? So we, have to, we want to discuss this entanglement and what it means. Now, since each row, row i, row 1, row 2, i is 1, row 2, and j is the summation index, if, they, if since each row can be written as a sum of pure states, that's the, the eigenvalue of the composition, we may as well take the rows, to, the row i's, j's to be pure. In other words, to go back, make that point a little clearer. Uh, here, each row can be decomposed, so you can, you can, uh, and, then, and uh, it's still, the summation is still a bit positive coefficient, so that's fine. So we can assume they're pure. We do not assume that they're orthogonal for different j, namely we don't assume anything like this. And so forget that, because that's a question that comes up all the time, no, we do not assume it. A pure state isn't necessarily entangled unless it's a simple product. That is the only, you cannot have more than one term in the summation because a, a pure state uh, has only one term. It's rank one, and if you decompose it, it, you can't decompose it into anything more than rank one. So a pure state is entangled unless it's a simple product. If it's a simple product like that, it's not entangled, otherwise it is. Uh, by the way, uh, often in papers and books, psi 1 tensor of psi 2 is written in this form. This is Dirac notation, uh, swallowing another Dirac notation, or I don't know what this, how you interpret this, but anyway, it is what it, I, I find this a little bit clearer, but some people like that <coughs> notation. Now, physicists often pretend that the states of interest are pure, that is, the, the row on two is, is uh, pure, but uh, that's not always justified. Now, usually when people talk about entanglement, they have in mind pure states, but that's not justified. Uh, consider the optimum situation that assume that our laboratory or our universe is in a pure state, so which I write this way. Then the row S of our system that we're doing the experiment on is on our lab bench, which is obtained by a partial trace uh, of uh, this uh, lab density matrix, getting rid of the environment. And this cannot be expected to be pure. So pure states are rather a rarity physically. It's very hard to, you really have to work very hard to get a pure state. So, so the fact that most of what I have to say is about density matrices which are not pure is, a, is not just mathematical fiddling. It really re represents the reality of a physical situation. Things are not pure. Sorry, um, I want to understand why we can't assume condition number two, because it seems like the eigenvalues of rho, or I mean, the eigenstates of rho are certainly all orthogonal to each other, so why wouldn't? Well, they don't have to be, is what I'm saying. They could be. But can all, can't I always pick an orthonormal decomposition? Of what? Of rho. Rho has some. Um, they could be. Hmm? I these, these guys are, are in different spaces even. They can be. Well, what you're doing is you're looking at a but, single... But anyway, I, I really don't care. What, I just want to emphasize that I don't care if they're orthogonal or non-orthogonal. It doesn't make any difference for what I have to say. That's the main point. Uh, on. Okay. So suppose our state is entangled. Uh, we want to know how to measure it. We want to quantify entanglement. And this entanglement has something to do with measurements. So we have to talk about measurements. 
and it has something to do with communication or, the, or whatever, or other physical quantities. And this definition eventually will involve Bell states, which we'll come to. Because those are the maximally entangled states. Those are sort of the, the, the unit, the coin of entanglement are the Bell states. And we, so we have to learn how to measure things in terms of Bell states. Uh, and then another question is, if we do have a measure of entanglement, <coughs> we want to know if it's faithful. Now, there'll be many measures of entanglement. I'm certainly not going to cover all of them. Uh, in fact, I don't know what they all are. But one of the questions you can ask is, does the measure have the property that it gives us a positive value if and only if rho on two is entangled? That is, we want to make sure that, or well, we would like to make sure if we can, that when our measuring uh, entanglement measure says positive, it's not giving us a false alarm, that it really reflects the fact that there is entanglement. As one might expect, such good measures turn out to be complicated to evaluate. In fact, it's not always easy to prove that a given measure of entanglement is uh, <coughs> faithful. And uh, certainly, it's in, in the interesting cases, hard to evaluate. Well, and part of the reason is because they're faithful. Uh, so what we'd like to find is some simple tests which are not faithful and do not answer the question definitively something is entangled or not, but give us partial information about entanglement, but which are easier to evaluate and therefore useful. Uh, these are called entanglement witnesses that tell us incomplete but useful information about entanglement. Oops. Now the first one I want to talk about is entanglement deformation. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> so, the following definition of entanglement has something to do with the number of Bell states needed to form our given state rho 1, 2, and I have to explain what that means later on. But now we look at its mathematical properties, and the definition is the following. You take your rho 1, 2 for two, two systems, and you do the following. You uh, you take, you break it up into a positive sum of states, density matrices, if you like, with positive coefficients. And <clears throat> for each of those, you take the entropy of one of the, now remember, uh, well, you take the entropy of one after taking the partial trace over two. Then you add them up with the same coefficients that you formed over here in the first place. And you take the infimum of that over all possible decompositions. Now, if you think about it, the end, well, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the omegas are, are density matrices. So, uh, so uh, since entropy is concave, remember we proved that the, uh, it's a, if I take a convex combination of two density matrices, the entropy of the convex combination is always bigger than the sum of the entropy. Um, since it's concave, we can take the omegas to be pure states. That can only make things smaller. So if they're pure states, then the entropy of one, uh, uh, system one, after taking the partial trace over system two, is the same as the entropy of two after taking the partial trace over one, because that's true about pure states. And so, the, despite the fact that this definition looks unsymmetric between one and two, it is in fact symmetric. It doesn't matter which one you, you first take the partial trace over and then look for the entropy of the other or not. Um, so if, if uh, this is what I've explained here. So our definition of the entanglement of formation, it's a funny word, entanglement of formation. We'll have to explain that. Our definition of the entanglement of formation uh, transports the usual definition to density matrices. Namely, the usual definition, if you have a, just a pure state, 
which is what most physicists talk about. If you just have a pure state, then the, uh, the entropy of uh, the subsystem, uh, a pure state, and the, you look at the entropy of the subsystem, and you call that the entanglement, that's the usual definition people use, well, I'm just doing the same thing, except I'm doing it for a density matrix, not for a pure state, by breaking the density matrix up into pure states, which I can always do. Okay, so, that, so we now have a definition of entanglement for density matrices as well as for pure states. Okay. And it's easy to see that this entanglement of formation is zero if and only if rho 1, 2 is separable. Remember what separable means. Separable means you can write it as a positive sum of uh, products. So if it's of this form, then you take those products as the definition up here, and you get zero. Um, <clears throat> so thus, this entanglement of formation is a faithful measure of entanglement. That is, uh, it's zero if and only if rho 1, 2 uh, is not entangled, if it's uh, separable. So I'm asking you to prove this for homework. It's very simple. So that's the next homework problem. Now, we know that. It's uh, not additive. For a long time, by what additive I mean, is it true that if I take two density matrices, rho 1, 2, and another one, uh, sigma 1, 2, that the, the uh, entanglement of formation is just the sum, which, you, what I, which is what I would get if I just, for example, talked about entropy. It, would I get the sum of the entropy, uh, entanglement uh, entropies? And the answer is no. For a long time, it was thought to be so. It was a conjecture that many people worked on for quite a few years <coughs> to prove that this is correct. And it turns out it's not correct. However, this is sort of mind-boggling. This is not true, but no counterexamples are known. How was it? How was the proof? Uh, How was what? Is this Hastings? Uh, That's Hastings. Yeah. Uh, Hastings did that. So it's it's a, a, a probabilistic proof, and uh, well, that's how it is. So we're waiting to find a counterexample where this is not true. We know they are they are out there. Okay. Oh, wait, I'm always going in the wrong direction. Okay, so now here's a second definition of entanglement. It's called squashed entanglement. Uh, this was introduced by Tucci, and then uh, shortly thereafter, Cristando and Vinza, who, who did not know about Tucci. Uh, <clears throat> it has something to do with the number of Bell states that one could extract from a given state, but I will not go into that further. Anyway, here it is. Here it is. Recall strong subadditivity, which says that whenever I have a density matrix over three spaces, I can talk about the total entropy of the whole thing. I can talk about the uh, entropy of one piece. And then I can talk about these two entropies. And I guess the picture was on the board. It's been erased. But anyway, that's it. You recall that this is always positive. And now what I'm supposed to do is, given row 1, 2, tack on a third space, just mentally. It's not physically, but just do that. And then try to evaluate this uh, quantity, which we know is positive, or non-zero. And try to make this as small as possible over all possible ways of tacking on a third space. You're allowed in this game to use any dimensional space that you tack on. And, and the, the half here is just for convenience. Uh, you'll see why in a second, because we get this statement here. So, um, OK, so one is asking for the extension of row 1, 2 with this minimum SSA difference. Now, it was proved, and this is not easy, so this is not a homework problem, because you have to work at this, that this is, in fact, faithful. So this is zero if and only if the row 1, 2 that you started with 
is uh, not is entangled, not entangled. <clears throat> and it's additive, however. Remember, I told you that the entanglement of formation. Uh, whoops, I'm always going to go on This is false. Hastings proof that this is false. But this guy is additive. And the proof of that is easy. It, it's uh, just use uh, the tensor product that uh, of the three of the H threes, the third space that you added to get uh, for the first row one two and the space that you used for the sigma one two, use the tensor product of those two as the third space up here, and you find that uh, you get this additivity property. So that's easy. What's not so easy is that it's faithful. Uh, <clears throat> And in fact, the entanglement of formation is bigger than or equal to the squashed entanglement. And that's easy. All you have to do to prove this, since you're taking the infimum, all you have to do is invent a third space, given row 1, 2, that gets you below this one over here. And that's rather easy to do. I leave it to you. And <clears throat> now this one. Uh, uh, is um, show that it's uh, zero if and only if row one two are separable. I, that you you should be able to do it a little harder. And if row one two is pure, then the squashed entanglement is just S one. You can see if, uh, that's that's uh, that's easy. Uh, <clears throat> now it's clearly this is a complicated expression up here, and it's clear therefore that the squashed entanglement is harder to compute than the entanglement of formation. However, we can find a useful lower bound to this quantity, and which is sometimes, uh, well, a useful lower bound, and that will at least help us get an estimate as to how small this can be. And uh, I'll do that next. <coughs> uh, it's not faithful, however, this lower bound, unfortunately. And it was derived together with Eric Carlin. Yes. And okay, here it is. And this is an example of the crazy kinds of things that you can get for free in the quantum environment. Yes. Um, so when you're saying, uh, hmm? can, can we go back to um, hmm? you say it's faithful, the only uh, condition you say, uh, the only reason when you're saying that it's faithful is because the, the quantity is zero that when if and only have, if yeah so that is the only criteria of being free yes uh, but it does not quantify it doesn't give you false signals uh, it does it gives, tells you information there's a number here yeah which is used so, I mean, but here you're saying that it's faithful such that uh, only when it's zero uh, when these two are separable so yeah. is, that's the only criteria of faithfulness yeah I'll go back I'll go back a page uh, where was it? Uh, well, let's see. Where did I define faithful? Can I find it? Yeah. If we have a measure of entanglement, does, it, uh, does this measure have the property that it gives us a positive value if and only if row 1, 2 is entangled? We don't it's not something like uh, the, the positive value is larger if the entanglement is more. But oh, it, it, it is. It's, it's quantitative. It's, you see, it doesn't, however, it doesn't give you numbers that are wrong. I mean, oh. what shall I say? It's nonsense. It, it doesn't give you a signal when there's no signal to be given. But it is quanti it's, it's uh, quantitative. See, the, the things that, when we come to entanglement witnesses, for example, they can, give you, they, don't, they can give you zero when the thing is entangled and vice versa. So they give you partial information but not complete information. Well, this guy is faithful, gives you the complete information, not telling you any false, uh, yeah. Let me give you an example. Is, is negativity not faithful? Because it can give zero. Negativity? Oh, well, just like the, This is never negative. Can't be. But I'm talking about a different, a different measure. Like, yeah. where, like if you just look at, you do a positive partial transpose, you look yeah. at the negative eigenvalues, you can, you can find pos all positive eigenvalues, even for entangled states. Positive eigenvalues of what? Uh, if you take a, take an entangled state and then do a positive 
partial transport. Uh, do a partial transport. Yes, you can get negative eigenvalues. You can get negative eigenvalues. Yeah. But you can also get there. Can, there exist in well, states where you'd have all positive eigenvalues in that test. No, not if it's a completely positive trace. Is that what you're talking about? Well, no, maybe I'll. Okay, I think we're, 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 we've got derailed a little okay. bit. Okay. Um, okay. Now remember, by purification, I got this remarkable inequality out of the strong subadditivity just by uh, purification. So it's that. This guy does not have to be bigger than that, and this guy does not have to be bigger than that, but the sum of the two is bigger than the sum of those two nevertheless. Now, <clears throat> now exchange the dummy, all these are dummy indices, so exchange four and one, uh, and write it down again, and you get that inequality. It's also true. Now add these two inequalities, this one and that one. You both you can add two things that are unequal. And you get this, S12 plus 2S14 plus S24 is bigger than S1 plus 2S2 plus S4. So what? Well, uh, now take this inequality and purify it. Notice that there are um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 terms in here. And I purify, that is, I invent a row 1, 2, 3, 4 whose partial trace over 3 gives me this. It gives me row 1, 2, 4. Right. And what do I get when I write it all down? I get this. Now that you recognize as being positive, that's strong subadditivity. The other two terms give you this. It's, so that's just this. This is just that inequality purified. It's remarkable. You get something for nothing. Now, this quantity, S1 minus S12, is minus the conditional entropy. Classically, this is always negative. The entropy of a big system is bigger than the entropy of a small system, classically. But in the quantum world, it does not have to be positive. It can be uh, negative. It can be positive. In fact, it's positive when S12 is in a pure state, for example and S12 is zero, and S1 isn't. So in that quantum regime, you have a question, but let me finish the sentence. Uh, in that quantum regime, you have a lower <coughs> bound to this strong subadditivity of entropy, which uh, was not known before. There's a lower bound to strong subadditivity. No, please. Yes. I thought we were not sure. Uh, on in the first equation, after the first fast equation? Yeah. After that, the yeah. first inequality? Now I just change indices. These are dummy indices. Right, so the typo as the rest. Nice. It's possible as a typo. Um, S1, 4, whoops, uh, I change 4 and 1, what did I do? If I change 4 and 1, I get S1, 4 back again. One, four, uh, 2 becomes 2, 4. 4 is 4 and 2 is, whoops. Right. Uh, what did two. I do? I did something else. Uh, 4 becomes 1 and 2 is, uh, that should be 2, not S12. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It shouldn't be S12. That's a typo. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what do we have? We have that the entanglement of formation is bigger than the squashed entanglement, and that's bigger than or equal to the maximum. See, I could have had a 2 here as well. What's the difference between 2 and 1? Right? So I could have S1 minus S12, with, or S2 minus S12, <coughs> or 0. We know it's always positive. So this quantity is bigger than or equal to the maximum of those three numbers. One of the, so it's certainly bigger than or equal to 0. And uh, Cristando and Vinta had this average, uh, had this similar thing, but with the average of these two quantities. You see, that's the average of this and that. And that's very different because the average can be uh, negative while one of them can be very positive. So the moral of this story is I can define the extreme quantum regime by negative conditional entropy. That is, one of these guys 
S1 is bigger than S12, for example. I can define it by negative conditional entropy. This never happens classically. And this is the regime of most interest to physicists. Uh, that is, for example, the ground state. In this regime, there is always squashed entanglement. That's the model of that story. <coughs> Any questions? Okay. Now, let me talk about entanglement witnesses. So we discussed two examples of faithful entanglement measures. And they are not easy to use, however. Uh, we also need simpler partial measures called entanglement witnesses, which can be used to help us to help us decide if the state is entangled or not. Doesn't doesn't give a definitive answer, but it can help us. The set of non-entangled and inseparable states on a given product of Hilbert spaces H and K is a convex subset of the set of all operators on H tends to K. That is to say, uh, if you add convex combinations of these density matrices, it's still a density matrix. So, uh, so let's call a convex combination, uh, this <coughs> state set I get by convex combinations this way, a separable one, two, the set of separable states. So uh, let me repeat that. I right, look at all the density matrices on the product of two, on, for two degrees of freedom or two spaces or two something. If I look at these density matrices, they can be very complicated, but they have the property that if you take a convex combination of any two of them, it's, it's, it's separable, it's still separable. That's very easy because you're just adding things that uh, define separability. So that's a trivial remark. So you have to think now, we're in the, the set of guys that are not entangled, the separable ones, are, some sort of subspace of the set of all density matrices and its convex it looks like this. Actually, it's got corners. It's not, it's not so smooth. It's very complicated, but I like to think of it as smooth. Right? It's a convex set of separable states. And so take a hyperplane. In this set of density matrices, think of a hyperplane going like that in this space. What is a hyperplane? It's a linear functional in the span of density matrices. So that row one, two, the one I'm looking at, is on the negative side of the plane. On the plane, even in spaces of very, very large dimensions, there's a positive side and there's a negative side, right? You have a plane. So, so more specifically, what does it mean to have a plane? It means that there's a Hermitian operator A12 on this tensor product so that the, the trace of A12 against the guy we're looking at is negative. So that means you're on the net. So the A12 defines the, the uh, linear map, uh, the, the, the plane, and you evaluate the, the uh, uh, row 1, 2 against this plane. That means you decide whether which side, which side you're on. And if it's negative, then, um, so, so tra trace is negative, and uh, uh, the trace of A times sigma is positive for all products, simple products. So we can do that. So, uh, so, that, so if we can find such planes, then we can decide whether our given matrix, a given density matrix for one, two, is entangled or not. Now, one way, uh, a criterion for this, right, what is, how do we find planes like this? Uh, it was discovered by the Horodetskys. That is to say, you take a positive, but not completely positive, map on H1. And row 1, 2 is separable if, when you take this, this positive map, tends to the identity on the second space, is a, a positive map. Uh, that has no, that is, has no negative eigenvalues. So, um, sorry, that the, 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 say that again, that you apply this to this uh, uh, positive map uh, to row one, two, that is this map phi one acts on the first factor of row one, two. The identity doesn't do anything to the second factor. If, if you can find 
a, um, a positive map so that applying it to row one, two, you get a positive, uh, uh, the result is positive, then row one, two is separable. That's a criterion that's equivalent to an entanglement of witness, and that was discovered by the Horodeskis. Now, in low dimensions, the only uh, maps that are positive but not completely positive uh, are just simply the transpose map that I just mentioned before. But in higher dimensions, there are many more uh, maps that are positive but not completely positive, and trying to find one is not so easy, but at least it identifies, it helps to identify separable states, that is, non-entangled states from the entangled ones. So if, if this phi 1 on row 1, 2 is positive for all such phi 1, for all such phi 1, then row 1, 2 is separable. So here's the picture. So here's this convex set of density matrices like this. Inside is row 1, 2, we, we think. We're trying to check whether it's. Now, if you take a plane and row one, two is on the negative, which way is it, the, the positive side of the plane, then that's an indication that it's in this convex set, but we're not sure. It could be out there, right? But if you take all possible planes and it's always on the positive side, you can surround the convex set, and that's what Horodetsky's uh, proved. That is to say, if, you, if this operation on row 1, 2 is positive for all such pi 1s, then you're, you're sure that row 1, 2 is inside this convex set. So you can define a convex set by the hyperplanes that bound it, or a tangent to it. And this is not a trivial fact. Yes, sir? Can you describe you in the, the phrase hmm? a is smaller than 0? What, what's that? That's the linear map. That's the the, uh, what is a hyperplane? It's, it's just the dot product, it's just taking the dot product into some vector, the normal vector. So the de vectors are down a matrix, so and the inner product is the trace. So How do you mean by be smaller than zero? What? If that's true. Uh, so w w what is the, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, So row one, two is not separable. That is to say, it's entangled. Uh, you know, that is given a row one, two that is not separable. Then we can find the hyperplane such that row one, two is on the negative side of the plane. Okay. So, so you yes, have to How do you okay. define this negative side? Okay. Here's how you define it. You take an A, which is a Hermitian operator, and uh, the, which you hope, I mean, you have to engineer this, of course. You don't, oh. you don't get it for free. A12 defines a hyperplane, and the hyperplane is lying on outside the convex set, and the negative side is over there. Okay. And if, if you take your row on two and test it against this hyperplane, if you get a negative signal, then you know it's not separable. And, and well, that's... So, so finding, finding this is not so easy. I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it's, uh, it, it, it's at least uh, something you can write down in, uh, in, in easy cases. So your convex, convex set is in, on the positive side of the yes. plane by definition. Right, by definition, that's right. OK. I will not do this. Oops. Okay, so let me come to Bell states. <coughs> um, so, well, you know what a qubit is, that's, everybody knows that. The Hilbert space is just C2. And <coughs> uh, there are four Bell states of, that I can form in C2 tensor C2, which is the same as, of course, C4. So, here's one. I take down tensor up, uh, tensor down, I'm sorry, down tensor down. That's a, a state in C2 and C2. So, and I add to that up up. Okay? That's a, a state in C2 <coughs> tensor C2. So that's a state of two qubits. 
But it's not a state yet, it's a vector, really. When I'm thinking of the pure state formed from this vector. And again, this terminology is sometimes traps even me, because this is not a state, it's a, it's a vector. And when I say state, I mean the pure state formed with this vector. That's what I mean. And there are four things like this that I can form. Um, I can have down, down, minus, up, up. Um, up, down, minus, down, up. Here I have up, down, plus, uh, so on. I can for, for, form four things like this. Of course, up and down could be any direction. They don't have to be this direction. It could be that direction. But anyway, these uh, there are four such states. And <coughs> these states form a basis for H1 tends to H2. H1 is C2 and H2 is C2. Uh, now, these states are maximally entangled. Why are they maximally entangled? Well, because rho 1, 2, uh, which I formed this way, uh, is, is of the following form. It's uh, these, all these Bell states over there in this form. There's something tensed something, uh, a pure state based on something tensed something, where these, are, these guys, j equals 1 up to the, the dimension, or the minimum dimension, uh, is, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, the, the size and the size are orthonormal basis for the H1 and H2, and this has maximum eigenvalues. That is to say, uh, its entanglement of formation, if you work it out, is very simple. It's just the logarithm of the minimum <coughs> of the two dimensions. And they're always together. You cannot separate them. They're definitely not separable. And if you ask how definitely are they not separable, well, this number that you get in this way is the biggest possible number you could get for the entanglement of formation. You can't make it any bigger. And what will you get? You'll get logarithm of the dimension is what you'll get. And uh, I'm writing it in this funny way. It's the minimum dimension because if you have uh, two different dimensions uh, in general, I'm speaking now generally, not the Bell states, if you have two different dimensions, the most you could expect to get is the logarithm of the smaller of the two dimensions. Okay. <clears throat> now, one has to be a little bit careful about my notation here. Most of the literature is based on logarithms to the base 2, in which case, uh, if, you have, if d1 is 2, you would have logarithm to the base 2 of 2, which is 1. But I'm using here in the definitions that I gave up to now, I'm using the logarit natural logarithms. And so, the, the, so now the natural logarithm of 2, which I don't remember. But that's Anyway, there is this question about the, uh, the base. Um, <clears throat> now, the next definition, I hope this is clear. Any questions about this? You cannot exceed this number for the entanglement of formation. If you, if you break it up any, other way, any way you like, the, the uh, entropy you will get is always log 2. Okay? Well, those are maximally entangled states. And since entanglement is what we're interested in, these guys, these states, well, actually these vectors, I should really say, these vectors are the, 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 I don't know, whatever, the gold coin of entanglement. We're going to try to measure everything in terms of these guys somehow. So the next ingredient that one needs in this story uh, <clears throat> is, the, is the LOCC, Local Operations and Classical Communication. Mouthful. So any density matrix on row H1 tensor H2, these are now arbitrary states. Uh, uh, that's not supposed to be n, can be converted 
the sigma 1 tensor sigma 2 and any k1 tensor k2 by some CPT map. So that, that is to say, if you have uh, any two states, rho 1, 2, or some, something else, doesn't matter, you can convert one to the other by a CPT map. So that's not particularly interesting. But we're interested now in CPT maps that act on one factor only. So that means it maps either the bounded operators on H1 into the bounded operators on K1, or it maps the second factor. So the first map is of the form phi1 tensor, the identity on the second. And the second kind of uh, operator of CPT map is uh, the identity times the CPT map on the second factor. These are called local operations. So I'm thinking of row one, two now as sort of two stations, sort of two telegraph stations or something. And I'm allowed to send any message or do anything on my end of the line, on one end of the line. And somebody else is going to do something on the other end of the line. And that's something that you do as a CPT map. That is, you're going to distort the signal somehow but you're only allowed to do it on your end. And that's why they're called local operations. And <clears throat> for convenience, if we take simple tensor products of local times local, we also call that local, because that just means the two telegraph operators are acting simultaneously, but it's still one local operation followed by another. And uh, usually we're interested with k1 is h1 and k, k2 is h2. That is, we're not going to change the Hilbert space, although we could. We're not going to do that uh, usually. We leave the Hilbert space alone. We're just going to change the state. Uh, now, there's a soap opera that goes along with this story. So in this soap opera, we have Alice and Bob. They're the actors in our soap opera, uh, soap opera. and we're, who, they are interested in trying to find out what row one two is. I mean, they're given a state, and they want to find out what it is by making measurements on it using only local operations. So Alice is allowed; <coughs> she's the telegraph operator over here. She's allowed to fiddle with this the row one part of the state. And Bob is allowed to do it on the other end. And they can communicate their results to each other. That is, they do measurements. And we have to define measurements. They communicate their results to each other by carrier pigeon, for example. That's the communication, classical communication part. They can, they're allowed to say, tell the other guy what they've measured. But, but each one is only allowed to measure one side of the story. And so usually this is written as row A, B for Alice and Bob. But I'm going to stick with row 1, 2. So first I have to define what a measurement is, what Alice and Bob can do. Uh, OK, so what does he never stop defining things and get down to business? No, eventually I will. All right, so what is a measurement apparatus? Well, it's a measurement apparatus on a state row is defined by a CPT map, which, according to Krauss, is written this way. Remember, Krauss said any CPT map is given by, uh, you take a bunch of operators and the times they're adjoints that add up to 1, m dagger m adds up to 1, the identity, and you apply it to row. So these, are, these M's are called possible measurement outcomes. So a measurement outcome is a choice of one, <coughs> one of these guys. And at the same time, reduction of the state, if you, although this is not essential, but you reduce the state to the one divided this, this normalization constant times m rho m. So in other words, you, you squash the state down. Right? And 
uh, so the, the CPT map, if you like, is the first of this form. That's the general map. But now, having looked at this, you, you now made a measurement that is you def you, your apparatus that you have tells you which of the states it's in. That is, what does it do? It reduces the density matrix to m rho m for one m. That's what a measurement does. But we don't actually need this uh, as far as we're concerned. We're just interested in the fact that there's a CPT map. Um, now, if we have a pure state, this just means we're taking the expectation value of the state, the vector psi, in m dagger m. Remember, the sum of these guys is 1, so this is a number less than 1. And that the state, the vector, is reduced to this vector. That's the usual Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. That's all we're doing. Uh, so technically, a local operation is a CPT map to operators on a Hilbert space uh, to make the measurement apparatus such a, map, such a map, we can define it as a map to H tensor L, where L is C, some C to some power, uh, some new dimensional space, and this is called an ancillary, which is a word I've used before. And the map is then the set of diagonal mu by mu matrices on C mu. So in other words, what you're really doing is think of a, a density matrix as a, some huge matrix. And you're taking the diagonal of this. You're not just taking the diagonal. It's not that crude. But you break it up into diagonal blocks. And you throw everything outside the diagonal blocks here. Yeah. <clears throat> so now the commercial is over. And we take you to Alice and Bob. OK. OK. Now this is what Schrodinger has to say about this. But I think. Um, I think I'll skip this, because um, I'm running out of time. OK. So here's an example of how this works, very concrete example. Alice and Bob know that rho 1, 2 is a pure state whose psi 1, 2 is one of the following Bell states. It's either this one or that one. Those are two Bell states. And they know that their rho 1, 2 is of this form. But they don't know which one. Okay. And they're trying to decide it. So H1 is a qubit in Princeton. That's this first thing. And H2 is a qubit in Timbuktu. Classical communication is not easy, but that doesn't stop this dauntless pair who are going to try to communicate with each other and make a measurement. So with the local operation, Alice measures spin up. So she's going to try to measure the first spin. She doesn't know that it's a bell state. She doesn't know anything. She just knows it. Well, she knows it's one of these, these two. And she measures spin up. So it could be this one, or it could be that one. Sorry, uh, spin up. Sorry, excuse me. It could be this one, or it could be that one. So she measures spin up. And she still doesn't know <coughs> what it is. Could be there or there. She measures spin up. Uh, she could have measured something else, such as the spin in the x direction, but that's a more complicated story. But it's basically the same thing. Uh, however, her measurement, indeed no measurement she could have made, distinguishes the two states. There's no way she could tell you that it's phi plus or psi plus. Right? They just can't do it. But she's made a measurement. So she knows something. And she communicates this to Bob. Now, Bob measures spin down, which he can do with a local on his side of the telegraph line. Uh, he measures spin down, and that clinches it, because she measured spin up, and he measured spin down. The only place that appears is in psi plus. The state is now reduced, by, according to Copenhagen, to uh, just this non-Bell state now. Right? They've, they've, uh, they've narrowed it down to the this particular piece, and they now have figured out by local operations and classical communication, that is, telling each other what they've measured, they can figure out it really had to be this state. But n neither one of them could have done it alone. Okay. All right, so that's an example. 
And now I want to, so one more thing I need in order to make this clear is a beautiful theorem of Nielsen. So Nielsen is the guy who wrote Nielsen and Chang, this book that I mentioned to you. It's a very good book. Uh, so what Nielsen uh, discovered, this is in Physical Review Letters, is just how powerful an LOCC operation can be. That's he has investigated that question. So we're interested in LOCC operations as we're interested in the kinds of operations that you can do on one factor of a bipartite state. And the question before the house, the last question I want to ask is, uh, I get till half past, right? You get to uh, 425. Hmm? You, go, you get to 425, I think. 425. Go ahead, doesn't matter. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Okay. <laughs> um, so I investigated the question, how, 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 uh, how much can you measure, really, with one, LLC, with one operation on one factor? Uh, now, this is a very difficult question to answer, and there's no answer to it, even now. But on, on the other hand, in the case of pure states, he could answer it, and that's why it's so interesting. So given rho 1, 2, and given sigma 1, 2 on the same space, H 1, 2, can we find an LOCC map that maps rho 1, 2 to sigma 1, 2? That, that's the question. And <clears throat> the general answer is not known, but the necessary sufficient condition is known if these are both pure states. Then I can tell you, or he can tell you, what, how, whether you can map this guy onto that guy by, by hitting one side. Okay. That's what an LOCC map does. OK, so now here's a little bit of mathematics. Suppose I take two ordered sequence of real numbers, D of them. So, so the answer is yes, if they're pure states? Yeah, no, no, no. The answer is not yes. Here's the answer coming. It's complicated. Not so true. No, no. That's the whole point. Uh, so if. If I have two ordered sequences of numbers, real numbers, lambda 1 bigger than or equal to lambda 2, etc., there are d of them here, d of them there, and their sums are the same, given two sequences like that. We say that lambda majorizes gamma, that is, this set of numbers majorizes that set of numbers, and we write it this way. Uh, uh, did I write it the wrong way? Yeah, no, that, I well. Um, well, anyway, uh, I should have written it, but it should be gamma majorizes lambda. Sorry, this is, this is a misprint. So, if the following is true, you take the partial sums of the gammas, that is, you take gamma 1 plus gamma 2 up to some gamma k, for any k, and you do the same thing with the lambda sequence. And you demand that the, sum, the, the partial sum of the gammas is bigger than the partial sum of the lambdas up to k, for every k. So the biggest one of the gammas is bigger than the biggest one of the lambdas. The sum of the top two gammas is bigger than the sum of the top two lambdas, etc., etc., etc. The total sum is equal in the two cases. If that's the case, then gamma majorizes lambda. Um, now, if both bipartite states are, are pure, and if rho 1 and sigma 1 are the reduced density matrices, uh, we look at the, so the total entropy, of course, is zero, but the rho 1 and sigma 1 don't have a zero entropy. They have eigenvalues. These are supposed to be their eigenvalues. Uh, then uh, there is an LOCC operation that maps one into the other, if and only if gamma is bigger than lambda, that is, if the eigenvalues satisfy this condition. And hence, if that's true, then since, turns out, since the entropy is a concave function, it implies that the entropies are not equal in this way. This is a very hard theorem to prove, by the way. It's not easy. It looks like a simple theorem in linear algebra, 
And it is a theorem in linear algebra, but it's a, one of the hardest theorems there is, and it's closely related to something called Horn's lemma, which uh, you can really break your teeth on. Uh, <clears throat> so a, a similar majorization theorem relates to the diagonals and eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix. Take a Hermitian matrix, it has diagonal entries, and it has eigenvalues. The diagonal entries are real, the eigenvalues are real. When is when are the two sets compatible? That is to say, if I give you two sets of numbers, two sequences of numbers, when can you say that one is the di diagonal of a matrix such that the second set are the eigenvalues? In other words, when can you fill in the off-diagonal elements? So that fixing the diagonals give you those eigenvalues. And the answer is only if the eigenvalues majorize the diagonals. Then you can do it, otherwise you cannot. And it's a very hard theorem. All right. So this is what Nielsen proves, that you can go from here to here, if and only if the sequence of eigenvalues of row 1 majorizes the sequence of uh, sigma 2, uh, sigma 1, 2, uh, sigma 1, excuse me. Um, did I say it the right way? Or not? Anyway, that's it. Okay. Now, that's time to stop. Uh, somebody standing there. And next time we're going to explain why it is, uh, based on what on this Nielsen theorem, explain what why entropy, remember x rho log rho or x log x, why entropy figures so prominently in the story of entanglement. That is, why is what is the role of entropy which which measures how spread out the eigenvalues of a matrix are. Why does this play a role in entanglement, which doesn't seem to care about eigenvalues? It cares about whether you can split up a matrix, a density matrix, into pieces, into separable pieces, um, into products, I mean. Uh, and that's what we'll explain next time. And, and an example of a closely related topic is going to be the generalized uncertainty principle of uh, Maasen and Ulfink, uh, which uh, uh, it sounds like it has nothing at all to do with entropy, but it turns out it does. And we'll, we'll explore that as a special case. And also, if there's time, we'll talk about the entropy of uh, fermions in here and, and the fact that fermions satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle. Anyway, that's for tomorrow. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> um, so I, I guess the punchline here is that for Nielsen's theorem says you can't go from uh, product states to entangled states through LOCC. Yes. Does does is there something that says that's still true for mixed states? Yeah. Everything here is mixed. Well, that, I thought you had to have pure states. Oh no. Sorry. I'm Sorry, Nielsen, yes. Nielsen, you have to have pure state. The condition is not known for mixed states. That's correct. So it might be possible to go yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. No, it, I don't think it is. But, uh, but, uh, but it, we don't know the Nessian is sufficient. Okay. Okay. Of S1 larger than S12? Oh, because for, if you have, and the ground state is a pure state, right? Mm -hmm. So a pure state, S12 is 0. In any pure state, the entropy is 0. So I have, so I imagine my system on the laboratory table is composed of two systems. Oh, big thing. I divide it in two, that's one, and that's two. The fact that the whole thing is in the ground state means that the entropy is zero. So S1, 
the entropy of one piece is not in general, it might be zero, but in general it's not. So that's an example where the conditional entropy is <coughs> negative. It's very non-classical. Right? Classically, this wouldn't happen. Classically, if the whole thing has zero entropy, the piece has zero entropy. But quantum mechanically, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's where you make your money, as they say. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, what will a not LOCC operation look like? And why did we exclude them? Why do we focus on them? Oh, because we, we're interested in communication, for example. So Alice is allowed to send any signal she wants, but she's not allowed to. I mean, what I have to imagine, I mean, it's, 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 it's all a story. I said it's a soap opera, right? So I have to imagine that Bob has one half of the system in his lab. That's in Timbuktu. She has the other half here in Princeton. But they're entangled. Now, she can't go over to Timbuktu and measure it. She, Airfare is too much, right? So, so she's just allowed to do this, and he's allowed to do that, and they're allowed to communicate with each other. But that's it. That's why it's local. Right? That's the game. I mean, this entanglement business has you know, lots of different meanings, depending on the physical context. One is communication. One is, uh, Cryptography, one is, you know, one is uh, physics that you can do it, experimental experiments you can make with just entanglement of two pieces of this, the same system. All kinds of uh, uh, physical situations in which entanglement arises. But this particular one is uh, you have in mind some communication, if you will. But this theorem of Nielsen is going to illustrate why it is that entropy, which is, you know, rho, x, rho log rho, why that has something to do with the measure of entanglement. Yeah, yeah sorry. You have to shout or I won't. <laughs> okay. uh, so this means, so LLCC maps are like really not invertible then? Like this is a one directional. No, they can be invertible. Well, okay. I mean, if you actually do the measurement, it's, you can't undo the measurement. That, right. if that's what you. Okay, okay, okay. So that's the interpretation. But the map, the map is a completely positive map from one place to another, yeah. and I can invent a completely positive map that will take you back, but it's not very practical. And I said, with a completely positive map, you can map anything to anything, essentially. Yeah. But LOCC maps are ones where you uh, have a bipartite state and you act on only one factor. So they're restricted class. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, I guess I'm Yeah, I'm just, I guess, um, yeah, so like, that you have to be. Um, decreasing entropy, unless you're keeping the same. I'm sorry, the, say, say it again. Uh, it's probably something. Okay. If I don't get off the stage, they're going to pull the trap door. No, you can answer it. You can answer it. Okay. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. Are there um, measures of entropy which are sensitive to the? So basically, in condensed matter, we are interested in distinguishing short range and long range entropy uh, entanglement. So, are there specific measures which are sensitive to the? Uh, well, this, in this kind of game, there's, there's no notion of distance or yeah. any kind. Of, uh, I mean, maybe there are, but I, I, I don't. What's the difference between short range and long range entanglement? Entanglement is entanglement. I think. Oh, no, no. I'm not sure that I know what it is. Do you know? Uh, 
It's a it's a paper from Shogun Wang. It's yes. hmm? it's a paper from Shogun Wang oh. where he where he describes this. Yeah, and uh, I I don't remember anything, but it, uh, I think these topological phases he said have all long range entanglement as a, as opposed to short range, and you cannot convert a long range entanglement state to a short range one. I'm sorry, I cannot explain the details, but if you if you Google Shogun Wang with with this I long see. range entanglement, you will find it. Okay, so this is very specific to physical models. Uh, I think I think he derived it generally. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, out. you have to look at that. I cannot explain every detail. Okay. I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Does anybody remember? I think it just means entanglement between parties that are distant, physically distant. Yeah. Yeah, I can, is that all? No, no, no. no. This no, 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 no. no, no, no. Long range short range has nothing to do with the party to listen. Well, no, no. I mean, it's, isn't it if you have some like lattice model, for example, or this is like a different thing, but um, it's the difference between, so you have some state, and if you can act with local operators to take it to uh, an unentangled state, then you have short range entanglement, but if you can, then it's long range entanglement. Is that right? Yeah, it has something to do with, with local product states. They, I think yeah. they local product states. Okay. Maybe we should have a seven no, hour. I think long range entanglement just means you have the entanglement, I mean, the, the states that entangle together in a distance that's I mean, comparable to the system size. So it's topological. Oh, so it is the question of distance. Yeah. And you disagree. Maybe I, maybe I the paper from Some, somebody yeah. will have to tell us this. Wednesday afternoon, we'll have a lot of time to discuss. <laughs> I mean, Thursday afternoon, sorry. Th tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. So maybe you can switch. All right, switch. Yeah. So okay, sorry. So yeah, Professor Lee will have uh, another lecture tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you have more questions, you can ask them. And we have the, uh, the last talk of today. Uh,